Test, test. Hello, everybody. Hello, good evening. For those who can read, the time is approaching 7 p.m., clock strikes seven, and the program, the show must go on. I know the pizza's good. You want me to like just talk louder? Oh, that worked. Yeah. I mean, I could actually pump the pump up the jams back there if I wanted to, too. This this mic system is actually pretty amazing. I've never gotten it to do feedback. Like, look how close I am to the speaker right now. Doot, 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 doot. I know, but yeah, it's it's pretty amazing system. You should see. It's sure mics. You know, you can always fifty eight dollars. Oh, oh, SM fifty eight. The guy knows his mics. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you do need audio stuff, James is pretty much your guy. Uh, Asher's, I don't know where he's at, but he knows his stuff too. Uh, yeah, let's see. But no, good crowd tonight. Uh, we're back here at Shopkick, you know. Uh, last time we were at Box, Guido was joining us, and it was a very, very large crowd. But here, I'm glad that, you know, it's cozy again, and everyone can talk to everyone and not feel rushed. How about Blue Line Pizza? You guys like it? Yeah, wow, that's a big response for pizza. Very good. Brendan will be happy to hear that it's money well spent. But yes, so tonight, July 25th, 2017, Peninsula number six or seven. And uh, <laughs> we've got five. Yes. Moshe. See, look, what, look at the chaos you've sown with this indexing of yours. So, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so tonight we've got three more great talks for you. Uh, we've got Aaron up first, talking about CFFI and Python integration with C. Uh, then we've got some announcements, hiring, seeking jobs, lightning talks, if you want to. Then Rory is going to regale us with tales of data science and making quality plots for you Matplotlib fans. And uh, then our third talk will be Mark, who has had some recent adventures with Docker uh, with a Wild West theme. I don't know if you're actually going to stick with uh, the... Okay, he's got a cowboy hat. All right. Uh, but yeah, um, I should also say, like, Wi-Fi is there if you want to follow people on Twitter while they talk. Not very polite, but long-term kind of polite. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then we also, uh, tonight we have a video game night here at Shopkick. Uh, what a coincidence. So if you ever get bored, you can be impolite and just walk straight across, straight back. And there's two Xboxes and two Wiis, and you can just, uh, you know, have lots of fun there. I don't get to play a lot of games, so I'll probably stick around after because I think it goes until late. Anyways, uh, so I guess without much further ado, is am I missing anything, Moshe? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, well, got it right on the first try. Let's give a round of applause for Aaron Gallagher with his talk on CFFI. You want to just talk straight into the mic? Will do. Hi, I'm Aaron Gallagher. I do software engineering at YouTube. Uh, hopefully my slides will come up here. Well, that's that's better. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so CFFI. It is the only right way to touch C from Python. Um, there's a little dagger there because it's this is kind of a mistruth because we're only talking about C. Uh, so everything else is worse. Um, it's it's not exactly a ringing endorsement, but CFFI is really the best thing out there. So. It's, it's kind of a shame that CFFI is kind of a late to the game, as it were, but it really does work um, astoundingly well. So let's talk about why these are bad. So, uh, oh, there it goes. OK, so CF, the CPython C API, ref counting. I, I really don't need to say more than that. So for those who have not had to deal with this already, C, the CPython C API is basically just, here's a pi object pointer, and if you use it, you need to incref, and when you're done with it, you have to decref. And you have to remember this. Um, forgetting to do so in either direction will either make your objects never freed, or you just crash sometimes, maybe. Um, so I mean, this is, this is kind of bad enough on its own, but there's more. If, there it goes. 
boilerplate. You have to copy paste structs with dozens of items. Like this, this really, uh, there we go, implementation details too. I mean, really, that is what C Python CAPI is. You have the internals of CPython. It's just a Python implementation. And they're like, well, people need to write extensions, so let's just show them what we have. Um, so all the stuff that you do is just kind of touching the inside of structs. Uh, I'll have I have some snippets of that later. You'll you'll get to see. But um, I mean, the thing is, why does this matter? Implementation details uh, that I'll also cover in just a sec. But so, what is bad about C types? It only targets the ABI. So <laughs> API versus API. The API versus ABI is kind of a uh, when you have uh, things like your defines and your enums and all this, this is something that you have to care about when you're binding to a C library because not all of this stuff is exposed in the <clears throat> sorry in the library itself, and so you require a C compiler to do that, which is terrible. But you have to like otherwise you um, I mean there's some things that'll kind of mitigate this, but you end up having to, like, it just codes it once. It doesn't actually look at the .h file that is relevant at the time. It's just always forever until you run the tool again, those values. Uh, it's very tedious. You also have to copy paste a bunch of stuff in from the, uh, to, to set the arg types, the return values, all of this stuff, and deal open. You basically have to re-implement a lot of what your dynamic linker already does, like look for uh, you know, your, your libraries on the system. Um, like half of the C, uh, C types projects I've seen out there also fail to work on the Mac OS because they don't know that on the Mac OS, your shared objects are called dot, uh, .dilib instead of dot .so. So Cython. Cython is great, but not for binding to C. Um, so this is what that little dagger was about. So when we're talking about C++, that's a whole other thing. C, uh, CFFI is not actually great for C++ at the moment. And um, Cython does handle it pretty well. But Cliff, Cliff is really new. It's great. You should use it. Um, but you might not be able to because it's so new. But there's a, there's a link. It's like Swig, but it doesn't suck. Um, it's it's written by people who realized that there are things that could be improved about Swig. Um, so that's about C++. And right, so this is all about C. I mean, there's, of course, the option to, if you're trying to bind to C++ code, then you can expose a C ABI because you have to deal with the fact that C++ and C code don't expose symbols the same way. Um, but so after all that, you know, how, how could CFFI actually be good? There's so many problems that you can have with everything. Well, so first, what is CFFI? So basically, CFFI is you have, you, you, you describe to CFFI what is it that I have on the C side and what is it that I have on the Python side. And it basically does everything else. There, I mean, you, you need a bit of stuff in your, set up that pi file, it'll generate a shared object and you can import it. And then, I mean, you can call directly from Python into C and also from C into Python. It's great. Um, I mean, there's the case of, you know, I, I wanna write, like I have Python code and I wanna make it fast, but I mean, that's what PyPy is for. You don't need to write C for that. So <clears throat> here's an example of the kind of thing I mean. So you have your CDEF, it's like, okay, that is basically just C syntax. It's a little trickier than that. It's a uh, domain-specific language that is mostly C, but not quite. Um, but so you define the things that you want to call, and that's in your, you know, the, the thing that CFFI reads to generate your thing. And then in Python, you just import the thing, and then you can call it, and that's it. So you do have to do a bit of second-order wrapping around unsafe bits where you know, you, you're mung munching pointers around. You have to have all of your CFFI code. Um, I mean, you, you have your CFFI exposed bits, and then you have to call, like, you have to build wrappers around them uh, so that it's safe. But 
this is logic that you can do in Python. You don't have to write C for it. So you end up not having to do super complicated things in C. It's all just Python logic. So, but the thing is that CFFI also makes it really easy to call from C into Python. So they have this special thing, extern Python, that you can put on functions in your CDEF. And then in your Python code, then your FFI object will have a uh, def extern. So you just you put in the same name, and then you can just write in Python code, and then C code can call it just, I, I hope this is all readable, <laughs> uh, but you can call it just like any other C function. Yes, that, uh, I, I copy-pasted that from the docs. I did not write that. So uh, yes, it's Python 2, but it, I mean, CFFI actually works really well across Python 2 and 3. Like, uh, it does things just right in terms of bytes versus text and so on. But so one of the really important things about CFFI is it abstracts out Python. Because I mean, this is really the problem with everything else. Uh, I mean, especially uh, the C Python C API is Python is very much part of everything you do at the like when you're actually writing your C code. So here's an example. <laughs> This is a bug that I found. It was crashing PyPy. So MX state time is uh, kind of an old thing. I don't think anyone really knows about anymore or has to care about. But so this is this is something that they had in their CPython C extension. So this is their MX state time free function. Uh, I mean, most of this isn't relevant entirely. I, I cut down to just this little bit, but basically, you have your pi object pointer that's passed in when you know your your object is done, and it treats it as a double pointer, and then jams some stuff into it. But see the important thing here. <laughs> if you know C, so basically this is the MX date time thing. That thing at the top that's supposed to be opaque. That is supposed to be implementation details, but they're just like all right. We're gonna jam some stuff onto it. This crashes PyPy, and yeah, that was that was fun to debug. Um, but so it worked on C Python most of the time. If you didn't compile with PyDebug, um, and they had a if def around this, but they didn't check for PyPy, so it crashed. Yeah. But so as I kind of alluded to before, one of the important things about CFFI is it uses a C compiler. So it doesn't have to; it can. Um, but the thing that you get out of this is that you have um, the ability to get things out of your C headers, like defines, enums, all these things that uh, <laughs> another fun trick a lot of people will do is they'll make a function that looks like a function, but it's actually just a macro. Uh, C Python does this a lot, actually. Uh, but so something like C types, you just straight up can't call that. It doesn't exist at the ABI level, which is all that C types can call. Um, CFFI does have an ABI mode, so it can work like C types, but in general, it's not necessary. It You can use it, like, in some cases, it's um, more convenient for, like, prototyping, because it means that you don't have to rerun your C compiler every time. But in general, it's, you, I mean, you get the correctness out of this as well. The C compiler gets to check your work. so. If your types don't line up, if your CDFs are not don't have the right types, then the C compiler will complain most of the time. But you can embed CFFI. And I'm going to, oh, I, I don't know if Moshe is watching, but you, you can embed it. But it's good. I, I, I am specifically going to say why. Yes. No, I, I'm going to tell you right now. So. <laughs> so the thing about CFFI that's different from the, the reasons why embedding is bad in CPython. Um, so here's some more stuff. <laughs> here's CPython. CPython has a lot of functions. It has way too many functions. This isn't even all the functions that you might need for embedding. Um, whereas for CFFI, that, that's it. I lied. That's it. Uh, you, don't, you don't even always need this. So 
The difference is that CFFI makes all of this stuff transparent. You like it still completely abstracts Python out of it. So anytime you call one of your extern Python functions or extern C functions, you know everything will have been set up uh, like in advance. Like you don't actually have to have thought about it at all. But see, the important thing here is that there is not really a distinction between the embedding and extending that there is like in CPython. You can have your um, you can have your code your initialization of your program in C or in Python, like you can have your Python test runner call into your CFFI, uh, like through your CFFI bindings into your C code. Um, one of the use cases that uh, Moshe has talked about before is um, like, what if I am trying to unit test GIMP? And, you know, because it has Python stuff. So you can have your PyTest binary or whatever. It can call into GIMP, call all of the initialization, and then just called the Python stuff like normal, as long as it's exposed in such a way that you know you can set up your state, you can call your, your Python things as necessary. It doesn't actually matter who starts the program, because everything is in the same shape either way. So yes, I mean, embedding isn't second class. Like it's, it is effectively treated the same as extending. Um, you might have to do this, like you you do have to do the same work in both places. Um, I mean, but you it is possible to do this. The the thing that's great about CFFI is that because it lacks all the boilerplate and so on, you can make it. I mean, it's a lot easier to actually expose all this stuff in both directions in the first place. You don't have to care quite as much about like you know well. You know, this is this is so difficult. Why am I having to do all this work just to call one like an additional function? Um, let's see. And CFFI is built in if you're using PyPy, but you should be anyway. Uh, <laughs> but even if you're not using PyPy, there's a lot of stuff out there already using CFFI. Uh, cryptography, Pinacle. Um, there's a lot of the a lot of the things, especially in the, the sphere surrounding the cryptography project that use CFFI because, I mean, it's, it's the right choice, like I said before. But no, it's, it's very likely that CFFI is already present on your system if you're writing a, a library or application or whatnot, and you're like, well, I don't want another dependency. You probably don't have to worry about it. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's about everything. I, I, don't, I don't know. I lost my timer, so I don't know if we have time for questions or. Okay. Uh, I'll start out the questions. Oh, I'll come bring you a mic there, Vicky. But uh, for the first question, uh, so is Cliff written by people who like work with TensorFlow and they were using Swig and they thought better of it, or I don't actually know if it has any connection to TensorFlow. I don't think so, but I, I mean, don't hold me to it. Sure. And and does Google slash YouTube use CFFI? Uh, CFFI or Cliff? Or uh, CFFI. I I mean, to an extent, like it's. I mean, there's third-party stuff using it. It's not used as much as Cliff. Oh, okay. But, yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's all sweet. Sure, sure. <laughs> Question. So I'm assuming that this is an open source project with a robust community. Oh yeah, no, this is this has the backing of the PyPy team. Like this, this is all done by the PyPy people because they needed something for uh, C extensions that wasn't just CPyX. Um, so it, it works really well. And I, I mean, so that's, it's um, actively developed. Like they have added so many features. Like there's a lot of, um, like the extern Python thing is actually pretty new. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's in active development. They add things like as they need it for PyPy. They're very responsive, so. Uh, so I'm just curious. I think you you said early on that uh, one of the advantages it has over C types is that you don't have to do. So I've used C types, and you had to like encode in every input argument and decode the output and everything. So how is that handled in C CFFI? You're talking about text versus bytes, or actually no, no, just like you know convert every uh, Python object to a C type. That's okay, so uh, I mean CFFI. I, I mean I. Th 
it's been a while since I use C types, but I thought that it generally worked the same way in that you have like your integer types are just a Python integer and so on. It has encapsulation around pointer types. Um, so I mean like when you get a pointer type out, it's wrapped in a thing, it's not just an integer. And when you pass the pointer type back in, I mean, you need it in that same shape. It doesn't just take an integer. Um, but I mean, for things like strings, like it'll take a byte string as you know, a car star and so on. Um, I don't know if that entirely answered your question, but so you can just pass a lot of basic Python types straight yeah, in and out. Yeah, I mean the. <laughs> You know, there's only like three different types in C. There's a uh, you know ordinal integer type, which is just passed straight through. I mean, floats too. Um, there's pointers, which are kind of encapsulated. I guess you, I think that it structs work the same way. That it's all going to be wrapped up in a in a thing. I don't think I've ever returned a struct from a function in CFFI. I don't know. I, I'd assume it works, but. <laughs> Um, have you looked at uh, Boost Python or PyBind 11 for this type of stuff? Uh, Boost Python, yes. I mean, it's effectively going to be the same set of problems as Python, where you are just targeting C, like the C Python C API. So, I mean, you lose all the the PyPy support. Um, it is a little bit better because it can use the C++ native stuff for the incrafts and decrafts and so on. Generally, I think it's been a while since I looked at it. I know that uh, there's also a Rust thing that does something in approximately the same shape, where it tries to use the deterministic destructors for the, the proper reference count handling. Um, I mean, really, yeah, all of this stuff is like you, you can get better than just writing straight up C, but in the end, you're just targeting C Python. And um, actually, that was one thing that I forgot to mention. So. There's actually a post on Python dev as of like a week or so ago where they're like, maybe we should reconsider some parts of the C API because they actually want to have a better garbage collector and all of this ref counting stuff gets in the way of that. And so factoring Python out, I think, is generally a good idea. Um, I mean, uh, sorry, factoring out like the, the specific implementation. I mean, I am fully in favor of the way that CFFI does it where it factors Python out entirely. but um, yeah, I I guess from a philosophical standpoint, I don't like those kinds of things. <laughs> and I haven't used uh, Boost Python in a while, but I haven't looked at uh, Py, uh, yeah. Py 11. Yeah, Py, uh, yeah. It's basically Boost Python, but without the boost. OK. So, so, <laughs> so, right. so the, great, the great debate rages on uh, between <laughs> Tesla and, and YouTube and all the others, I'm sure. So it, it'll, it'll make good, good discussion uh, for afterwards. Um, any real quick last questions? OK. Well, in that case, another round of applause, please, for Aaron. Thanks. All right. So now we have an announcements segment here hiring people looking to be hired uh let's see other things of that sort there are multiple mics if you'd like to sing a duet oh moshe you want to sing a duet with me <laughs> that's more a joke on my part moshe will not hesitate to sing <laughs> but, but i i'm not gonna do it to you right now that uh but uh one thing i did want to say is um, we are always, always looking for two things in this meetup, and that's uh, more people to speak. Even if you have not spoken before, 15 minutes is pretty short, as you've seen. Uh, it's uh, pretty easy to prepare a talk, so this is, should be a good first opportunity for you to speak. If you have spoken before, of course, uh, we will also have, be happy to have you speak. So uh, if you want to speak, uh, talk to me, uh, Mahmoud, uh, Kurt, or where's the mark? Mark, raise your hand. Mark ran away. He got stage fright. Oh, man. Uh, OK, um, so talk to any of us, and we will be uh, happy to uh, figure out when we can uh, schedule you in. And the other thing we are always looking for is more places to uh, host us. If your company would like to host us, uh, please, again, talk to Kurt, uh, Mahmoud, uh, me, or Mark. 
and we will figure it out. Um, so thank you. That's all I have to, oh, I guess, uh, um, what I'm up here. Um, uh, Shopkick is hiring. Um, so um, mostly uh, what, what, what we're looking for right now is engineering leads and senior managers. And that uh, we are looking for people with previous experience in leadership and management respectively. Nice. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I'll echo that, but also want to echo that like talks, right? Like this is a great place to get your, your first start, right? It's a 10 or 15 minute talk. You know, we're not like going to beat you, browbeat you for like 30 minutes or something like that. So if you have an idea or if you're a first timer, really don't hesitate. We, we like to see more uh, new blood. Not that we're like uh, dreading Mark's talk. Uh, he's still not back yet. We can shit talk him. All right. Uh, <laughs> anyways. Um, yeah, more uh, announcements? Yeah, any announcements? Anyone uh, uh, either hiring or looking to get a job? Oh. Yeah. Karen. Oh, yeah. Uh, just, uh, <clears throat> it's a short-term thing, but I'll make an announcement anyway. Um, the company that I've been consulting for is looking, um, it's basically like a website they need to create. Part of it's dynamic, part of it's static. So I'm looking for somebody that understands Python, but also understands kind of the... Um, design part of things, um, being able to put something together that looks nice, but also understands that there's a development uh, back end of it too. So if you do that sort of thing, just let me know, James, Abel, so I'll just be sitting over here. Okay. I'll go up Sean or Jessica. I'll go. Hi, I'm Cameron. Uh, I spoke at the last uh, Peninsula. Um, from Simple Legal, so we do um, basically spend management for the head lawyers at companies. So we're not facing uh, law firms themselves, we're facing the person who hires the law firms. And uh, we're hiring, um, we could use senior people, and we can also use junior people. Um, really, we're, what, needed to hire like uh, three so months ago, maybe? <laughs> yes, I mean, we, we're a pretty small engineering team. We have a Python, Django, now React stack. Um, we do solve interesting problems. Um, accounting software for lawyers sounds boring, but you get to build some cool stuff, actually. So um, definitely give us a give us a holler. Um, Ian here is also um, from Simple Legal, and he works mostly on the uh, JavaScript React side of things. So if anyone knows JavaScript and wants maybe some some opportunity like that, give us a give us a talk. So yes, we're like five people. So if you joined us, you'd be really making a huge impact on the future architecture and. Um, there's a lot of impact you can make at our company, and we'd love to talk to you. So, more announcements. Don't be a stranger. Is Lyft hiring? If if you have a, a project you're yeah. working on, you want to talk about, also you're welcome. Yeah, here, Roy. Uh, it always feels dirty. Yeah, I've been doing the spiel. Uh, hi, I'm Roy from Lyft. Um, I uh, own a lot of our Python stack, so pushing for Python three, pushing for types, types, all that good stuff. Uh, Lyft is always hi hiring in all roles, uh, especially right now for data science. One of the things I think is actually pretty unique about Lyft <clears throat> is that we make heavily use the, of pretty much every part of the Python community, whether it's uh, operations with using Salt for managing machines or uh, Flask and GVent and Unicorn and the web service side of things, uh, in addition to Pandas and NumPy and SciKit and all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but one of the things pretty unique is that we do that all on the same services. Like it's fairly common for us to, in production, be using constraint solvers and NumPy and SciKit and all this good stuff in the process of serving requests for our customers. Um, there's lots of very interesting kind of data science meets operations problems that we solve with things like figuring out what pricing, what uh, what kind of prices we should be charging, or even which drivers to dispatch. And if another driver shows up, should we assign them to someone who's they're closer to, but that'll like cascade through the entire system. Um, so if you're interested in these kinds of like optimization problems, these kind of data science problems, uh, come talk to me. Thanks. Cool. I, there were some other new faces here from some new companies. Uh, Tesla, a couple people. Uh, Tesla, I don't know if it's hiring. Uh, what do you call it? Walmart hiring. I don't they know. Have cars, but not taco mode. Oh, okay. So so Lyft has taco mode. Tesla has um, l ludicrous mode. Uh, sure. Uh, and an office in San Mateo. Yeah, so there's a lot happening in the peninsula. Make sure to chat. We have another uh, intermission where we can do more announcements and so forth. But for now, I think the time has come for 
Rory from Allstate to uh, give us a great presentation on data science. I saw some graphs up there. They look great. So they're not yours. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, I'm sure yours are even better. Uh, all right, Rory, here you go. And round of applause for Rory. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Um, yep, I'm at Allstate. I, I assume they're hiring as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in uh, Northbrook, Illinois. Yeah. Insurance, uh, that's quick smell. Uh, insurance is actually more in interesting than you think. So I don't know. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk about here about uh, data science. I am like a, a, a researcher in their sort of innovation hub they've got in Menlo Park down on um, Marsh Road. So I look at a lot of plots. I read a lot of research papers. And I like complain a lot about plots. So <laughs> this is not, I'm not going to be like telling you what terrible plots are, embarrassing people. I just want to try to go back to the basics, talk about the fundamentals of what we want to do with a plot, what should it do. So I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence here. We're just going to talk about plots for like 10 minutes. Yep, so I've already started on the philosophizing. Um, it's about the first half. Second half is uh, the Jupyter Notebook, and the third half might be some, some uh, examples. So let's get going. Um, what are some great plots? Let's like start you know, with, so this is um, the Higgs boson, won the Nobel Prize. And this is like a pair of plots that basically show what they found. Right? So the story they're telling here is, OK, we've got this p value, which is our indicator of how likely is it that this happened by chance. If this p-value is very small, it means you found something real. If your p-value is 1, it means you just have some random fluke in your data. So what they're showing is you've got this dip here. And down there, if your p-value is 10 to the minus 6, that's 1 in a million. So the chances are you found the Higgs boson, and you're happy, right? That's, yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of other garbage that you'd have to ask a, like a high-energy physicist, right? But that's the main story of here. Uh, here's the second plot I want to talk about, uh, gravitational waves. I believe these guys are also going to win the Nobel Prize for their discovery. And again, this is basically, in one plot, I'm showing you what like took decades of work from thousands of researchers. And what we're seeing here is basically the real data overlaid with the expected numerical result. So decades of work on numerical relativity gave you this sort of expected in spiral pattern. And then decades of work on this detector gave you the real result. And then you overlay the two, and you find a match, and you celebrate. So that's basically the story of this plot. So far, so good. And uh, I should mention, like, these guys don't even, they, they use uh, this plotting package called root. Um, these guys, I believe, this is matplotlib. It looks a little nice for matplotlib, though. I'm a little suspicious. <laughs> yeah. OK, so plots tell stories. Um, and this is going to be the third story from this philosophizing. All right, so what are we looking at here? We've got calculated joint temperature in degrees Fahrenheit on the x-axis. Scale is 60 degrees, 70, 80. OK. And then what do we have here? We have number of incidents, 0, 1, 2, 3. And they've put a scatter plot up, right? What do we see? So what are, what are we looking at here? It looks like basically there's no pattern, right? Is that basically what we're seeing here? There's for as you change the temperature, you have the same number of incidents. Namely, one. OK. All right. Well, now we've, we've added some data to this plot. We've added the case of zero incidents to this plot. And now we see, oh, this is up on the higher range. right? So for higher temperature values, we have zero incidents. For lower temperature values, we're seeing cases of one or two. right? So these. Data is actually the O-ring data from the Challenger disaster, right? And so we're telling completely different stories based on the content of the plot, not based on whether you're using ggplot, 
matplotlib, plotly, right? It doesn't matter. The, what matters is what's in the plot. And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to convey here. That's really what we should care about. And that's why you should use matplotlib, because it gets the job done, right? Uh, okay, so what am I at? Oh, this is another recommendation. If you're doing slides, give uh, of, of a total so you know I'm almost done, right? <laughs> Seven of eight. Uh, all right, so what do we want in a plot? We want a title, right? Because the title tells you what this thing is. We want labels on our axes because it tells you what they are. And importantly, we want units on those labels so we know how many widgets you're selling. Are you selling millions of widgets, billions of widgets? You know, this is like a lot of money, right? It matters. And then, of course, same for the X. Um, and again, also, the scale matters, right? You should, if we go back to those previous plots, the scale is really important. So you should think about that. Don't just, like, throw it out and say, job done. You should sort of think about all these aspects and make a beautiful plot. Tell a good story. Oh, uh, caption. So if you remember those first two plots, they had this huge caption, right? Like text and text and text describing what's in it. And the idea is if you have a plot in something that's meant to be read or like printed out in red, it should really be independent. I mean, think of this in, in functional terms, right? If you're writing programs, you basically want things to be independent. And plots should stand independent of the text. So someone should be able to ignore everything you've written, dial in on your plot, and fully understand what's going on. This is actually what people will do. So like professors in a field with lots of experience, your manager's really busy, they're not gonna read all your report, they're gonna probably look at the couple of key figures, see what's going on, and like give you a rubber stamp or something, I don't know. Um, any questions about that? Cool. Um, all right, so matplotlib. I came from a, a MATLAB background, so it was very natural. When I couldn't pay for MATLAB, I go to Python, and I start using matplotlib. All was great. Um, the thing that I miss most is this graphical interface that you get in Mat, Mat, uh, MATLAB, where you can tweak it, tweak your plot, you actually see it, whereas here you just have to re-execute code. Other than that, you're pretty great. Um, it's self-contained, so everything you need is sort of in it, which is really cool. If you've ever tried to plot, like with LaTeX, it's a disaster. It was like dependencies, and you have to install this stuff, and it's not fun. Um, the API, I mean, this this is an old language, the old thing, right? It's 20, 30 years old. The API is well known. It's cherished, but it's also very weird. Um, so that's the con. Integrates well with pandas. I use pandas all the time, so that's great. Um, plots look good. They don't look great. So I say good enough is good enough, and I call it a day. Um, as I was like, you know, going back to the content is really what's most important, not really like the LaTeX rendering and typesetting stuff, right? We just want a plot that's good enough that works, and then we can go on with our day. So that's about it for that. Um, let me just show you some code. How am I doing on time? Four minutes, great. Uh, all right, so this is my 10 minutes to matplotlib. Can everybody see it? Cool, um, so let's just start going. So I, this is basically how I work every day. I'm just pulling out a Jupyter notebook, download some data from the internet, and then I like open it up in pandas. So that's what I'm doing here. And then I can make some plots. Okay, so this is basically just the default plot. And you can see I've, I've read this into pandas, and then I just call the plot function and it spits out a matplotlib plot. And you know, if I'm doing this myself, I would say job done, right? I've, I'm looking at my data here, I'm looking at um, sunspots going you know, all the way back you know, like 1700s. So I, I don't know why people were counting sunspots, but they were. <laughs> so we have all this data going back hundreds of years. That's cool. Um, and one cool thing is if we do that, take out 
the legend, which I don't we don't need. Do that. So this is cool. What I've done here is before is that box, and now it's more square. So I've changed the aspect ratio, and this is something from um, the uh, elements of graphical plotting. I have a book here I can show you guys if you're interested. But what's kind of cool is now we've sort of limited the slope. But before they were you know very vertical, and now they're more horizontal towards 45 degrees, and that actually tells us some new information that we can see here. What we can now see is that they rise more quickly. Then they fall. Can you see that? It's rising and then it's falling more slowly. So before, with the more square aspect ratio, you couldn't see that. Whereas now that we've sort of scaled everything down around 45 degrees, you're getting more information from your plot. So that's a tip you can use. <clears throat> so that's like the main way I do plots. It's just using um, pandas, and then so I'm using pandas, and then I'm just throwing in this PLT that X label, and it just overwrites stuff. It's really cool. All right, so now we're, again, doing some plots. Um, the other way you can make a plot is to, you know, plt.figure, say what figure size you want, um, set the X limits that way. And then what I'm doing here is the second way. There's like a million ways of doing things in matplotlib. One way to do it is to get the current axes and then set properties of those axes. And that's the way that works. And it's got a built-in tech render. So that's kind of cool. You don't have to install LaTeX. That's neat. And my final plot here is I'm looking at, oh, let me just show you the code real quick. Just set up another plot. This is like the third way you can use matplotlib. You can set up a subplot, pull out the axes, and then plot into the axes. So that's kind of hopefully straightforward. I don't know. There's tons of examples online. Hopefully I've convinced you that it's worth your time to learn it. And then you get this kind of plot where we're sort of looking at correla uh, the correlation over time. And if we bump down here, um, the scale here is years. So we see this maximum around 11 years, which is what we'd expect. And we're happy. That's about it. Thanks. Cool questions for Rory about Matplotlib. Mark, OK. I'm allowed to ask a question. Do you have any um, recommended, like, introductions or overviews of matplotlib's api because it is very strange as you said and the tutorials are very it's like they're disjointed or a lot of the examples are disjointed so it's hard to see like a cohesive view on that api so do you have any recommended like documentation mm. yeah um it's a problem i totally <laughs> buy that um i would spend a little bit of time just googling like matplotlib examples Okay. That's by example is really the best way to go. Okay. Like they even say that in documentation. Just find a plot that you <laughs> like and copy it. <laughs> <laughs> they do say that. <laughs> Thank you. Along those lines, you see like a couple of different ways to set up the map plot website. Sort of the thing where you have the same machine built in and you can build up your graphs versus. There's a, a couple of different ways you map plot lib or a state machine where you build up your graph uh, versus sort of a more object-oriented way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on when to use one over the other or or what? Yeah, I mean, I think one time you like this, uh, I'm sort of like up here, like this first example, I'm really going you know, fast and loose. Like this really shouldn't work at all, right? Like what the heck is going on here? This PLT somehow figured out what like Pandas was doing. So if you're doing this programmatically, like this is not, the interface you want, because you're probably going to get all kind of ex unexpected results as you stack up um, figures. So that's where you probably want to go down into like the more manual, like setting up um, individual axes and figures and working that way. So what's happening there is it's using global state. Uh, like there's one global figure that you are adding stuff to, and okay. then you have to when you're done and you've rendered <laughs> it, you reset it. Is cool. that right? Sure. Okay. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I try not to ask too many questions about Matplotlib. <laughs> so you said you used MATLAB before. Uh, is Matplotlib like very similar to MATLAB? Yeah. Okay. Um, you have the same 
kind of paradigm of a, a figure, and then within a figure, you have um, axes, and then within an axis, you can plot like a line plot or a scatter plot. And so that's that's the paradigm has been borrowed here from MATLAB. Decimal code binary, yeah. Uh, do you use do you use stuff like uh, Seaborn to make it look nicer? Do you ever do that? Yeah, um, yeah. It's just import uh, Seaborn, and it sort of does its magic behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Or you can also just use the Matplotlib style uh, GG plot mm -hmm. if you want to use that. You know, sure. looks great. Any other questions about Matplotlib? All right then, round of applause, please. Thank you, Rory. All right, so now we have a, another uh, intermission. Uh, basically, you know, lightning talks, announcements, all these sorts of great things. Uh, yeah, we got 15 minutes. Something you're working on, something interesting? I think that we have one person over there. Are you joining the Hangout now, Al? OK. In the meantime, Facebook hiring? Instagram, always, always hiring. Talk to these guys. Yeah, and talk to Cooper. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, myself, I've, I've been working on my URL library every morning. Uh, it's a mess. URLs are kind of a mess. Oh, I have, I have a section in the docs about that. There are several others, but like, you know, it varies, like basically like some of them. <laughs> Let's mute that one over there. Uh, some of them use like IPv6, uh, like don't have IPv6 support. Some of them don't have like IDNA support. Uh, yeah. yeah. Are you muted? It's a red button at the top. Out, <laughs> All right, there it is. Whew. I should have put a note in there to mute. If you want to join the Google Hangout and broadcast like this, always mute yourself. OK. Uh, but yeah, then go ahead and, and uh, share your desktop. It's a green thing on the, hello. Yes. Yes, Cooper, you can be broadcast. Say hi, mom. All right. <laughs> Not even her own son? Jeez, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Hmm. See? Announcements? Who's going to Pi Bay? Oh, right. Pi Bay's coming up. Let's see some hands. If you haven't yet, there's still some tickets available. I'm definitely going. I'm speaking, actually. <laughs> uh, I better be going. <laughs> yeah? About 50 people, right? No, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, wow. We got a pretty good segment here. We could. Oh yeah, sure. So I'm talking about uh, packaging, uh, basically general Python application and library packaging. Let's see. Next in line here. Say your name too. My name is Mahmoud. Uh, I'm Yana. At PyBay, I'll be on the panel about static typing. Ah, okay. Yeah, James again. Um, I'm talking about Lattice, which is um, uh, it's kind of like Dropbox, but it's uh, open source in Python. Uses AWS, so if you want to run your own with your own source code and hack on it yourself, uh, it's a fun thing to do. So. Definitely, indie web, yeah. And uh, Kurt, I'm Moshe. This is Kurt. I uh, will be talking together uh, about uh, introducing best practices into legacy applications mm -hmm. in Song. In song, yes, in duet. We will sing a duet. I will make Kurt sing a duet with me. I'll, uh, that's my responsibility. No, no, no. And it, um, maybe not. Kurt's uh, very we'll unsung. <laughs> uh, it does not involve Twisted, but it involves. Uh, we'll see what version of Python it involves. That, that's going to like be like the Twisted. Yeah, Moshe, you're, get, you're uh, getting typecast. People have expectations of you. I haven't talked about Twisted. <laughs> the last five talks I've given were not about Twisted. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. All right, Al. How, Mark how is going to typecast. I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the big board here. Yeah. Oh, here's a mic. So everyone, this is Al. He's got a little demo he's like to show us. So um, my name is Al Margolis. I've been 
a coder for like 50 years and electronic copies for longer than that. Uh, found myself between things earlier this year. Uh, there is another meetup, DIYRoboCars.com, that meets in a giant warehouse over in Oakland, and we are developing autonomous car software platforms using RC car chassis. Uh, cheaper accidents that way. Uh, so I got involved in that, and um, that led me down this you know kind of crazy software development thing since I had too much time on my hands. Uh, so I am you know I had to learn OpenCV. I started to learn Ross and uh, kind of gave up on that and just decided it was easier to build my own equivalent, um, and had to learn OpenCV. Uh, and what I want to do is a real quick demo of this thing. Does anybody use OpenCV or try to? Uh, one of the things that's curious about it, you look at all the documentation for this graphical thing, um, and there are almost no visual examples. Um, and what's there uses these very clean images that are very easy to abstract from. Um, and there are a million parameters which aren't explained. So I built this tool to help my, me understand what it all does. I've got this pull down, which if I had my robot with me, which I could do if there's interest, it pulls the camera off of the bot. Otherwise, I'll bring up my webcam. You'll see my pretty face. And so that is just showing the image. Uh, one of the oddities of OpenCV is BGR versus RGB. So that's why my complexion is ugly. I haven't quite decided what I consider correct. Um, now I can add a tag. Uh, and what that's done is applied the OpenCV uh, black and white transformation, uh, which is pretty easy to understand. Um, I can add another tab. And I will play just for a minute with blur. Um, and it has this kernel thing here. And so if you look at it now, I'm a little bit blurred there in the, the current picture. And if I change that to 11, I'm more blurred. Um, well, I'm not sure that would do. And so I am more blurry. Um, turns out that's not all that easy. I'm now going to go to Canny, which is starting to help pull out entities. Um, uh, and I'm just going to do one last step here. Uh, find Cantor. This is all done in TK. It's another sidetrack I've gone through. I didn't want to use QT because I didn't like the license. Uh, started on TK, which is insanely verbose. Uh, so I built my own library. Uh, so this interface you see here with all the tabs and stuff is probably only 30 lines of my high level UI on easy TK. And I, I have, a, you know, six months of sidetracks mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so here you see me, those red lines are the contours that are coming out of uh, um, a contours and I'm plotting those. Uh, it took me weeks to figure this out the old fashioned way, make a call, say that as a JPEG, look the JPEG, go back, change your code. Now I can interact with all of that. Um, this is kind of alpha stage. It's, I can add uh, filters easily. Um, all this is being exec, uh, so I can save that out as a separate program. Um, and I'm working on the functionality that I can come up with a series of filters, a process, and then ship those straight over to my robot and have it start using that within its vision system. Uh, so I don't know what to do with this. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if this is unique. I don't know if it's interesting to anyone put, else. Put it Maybe. on GitHub, step, step one. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so if anybody's interested about this, my raw stuff, um, I'm tr trying to figure out what to do with all of this. Also trying to figure out what to do with my life. I kind of need a job. Um, so you know, I, I do pretty intense Python since about one dot teens. Um, I also do COBOL, Fortran C, assembler on a lot of microcontrollers. Uh, I worked for a bank for eight years. I worked for a phone company for about eight years. I've worked in the insurance industry. I've worked for lawyers. So um, uh, if anybody's interested, but I don't do modern interviews well. I've been employed for all those many years and only been through about three or four interviews. The last ones were about 
40 years ago. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, I don't really do well with, you know, you know, I read Knuth when it came out, 1973 or something. Uh, I don't necessarily have it all at the top of my head. So any love to talk to anyone. I'll be here till whenever. <laughs> Thank you. Al, Al Margolis. Uh, if you Google that, it'll probably come up. It's Al Margolis at Gmail to get to me directly. Very good. Very nice. What was that weird filter where OpenCV? I don't know if this is a feature, but I saw it flash like target identified. You said this is like some robot code that you're running? <laughs> uh, well, the, the two things that I'm doing is at the warehouse, we're trying to do freeway driving. So we've got lanes and we need to follow the lanes uh, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's Robo Magellan is another comp competition where we follow GPS waypoints to try and find orange cones out on a college campus. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I've written my own high level robot language <laughs> that uh, controls the robot. And so you can do a lot of stuff without actually getting into the point. No, that's great. That was actually, Isaac had some questions about TK that I, you know, were a little bit out of my league. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we probably want to talk to Al over here. I mean, it looks great, actually. I mean, I don't think QT could do a lot better. It's great. Yeah. All right. Other demos, announcements? We have one more talk, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough to top Al's thing there. Definitely get in touch, I think. All right. Well, Mark, are you almost ready there? He has to go last. No, you asked to go last so you could do some last minute preparations. Oh, no, no, no. This was for pure fun. Okay. <laughs> Mark, Mark is always ready. He's always ready. Um, <laughs> well, everyone, <laughs> this is Mark. Let me just switch over to his slides. And then as soon as they come up, you can just, you know, slam just it take with it, the applause. Take it oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Give it up for Mark. So you might know this. I'm, I'm Mark Williams. Um, you might remember me from a talk called uh, Test the Right Themselves and uh, meetups such as this one. I'm a co-organizer. Uh, right now, I'm a freelance, freelance software engineer. Um, I specialize in data engineering, uh, general infrastructure, kind of hand-waving, uh, and DevOps, because that's unavoidable. Um, working in and near DevOps, being kind of adjacent to that and working directly with it, and certainly working with infrastructure, has led me to form some opinions about Docker. So how many people here know what Docker is? OK, good, because this is not going to be an intro talk. I'm going to change your mind. I'm going to bring you into the fold of Docker skeptics, because I'll admit, I am a skeptic of new technologies. Um, kind of that's like a, I'm like risk averse because I work in DevOps and infrastructure. You know, something sounds really cool and it's new. It's like fun to use. But if it breaks, nobody knows how to fix it because it's new. And that always will break during your vacation or while you're sleeping. So I'm definitely a skeptic of new technologies, um, especially ones that are ambitious. Because the bigger the plans, the higher you fly, the farther you have to crash. So that means I'm kind of a skeptic of Docker. Um, I've looked at Docker a bunch of times, going back to like 2012, 2013, 2014. Took a break in 2015. Took it easy. 2016, I looked at it again. And each time, I found that it wasn't really suitable for what I wanted it to do and what it was marketed to me to do. Um, since then, I've taken a look at it again in 2017. Uh, and I have actually been using it um, for some important stuff that part of my contracting. So it's like helping me eat. So uh, I've changed my opinion of it a little bit. And I think I have a more measured view. Um, so I'd like to start with like what's good about it. Good thing about Docker is that it's a fresh look at applications. What does that mean? Well, that when I said it was ambitious, um, it, it means that it's like reimagining what it means to write an application. Um, it's mostly targeted, like obviously targeted at server software. So like a web server or mail servers, that kind of thing, right? Not interactive stuff. Um, back in the day when we wanted to like build and deploy these, we would build daemons. I don't know if anybody remembers this. I'm sure people have written their own demonization code. Um, if, though, if you're not aware, in the world of Unix, daemon has a very precise technical definition. It means a program that no longer has a controlling terminal. Um, and that actually means that there's no interactivity. It's not part of an interactive session. So it's running in the background, you might say. Although that means something specific with shells. It's running like nobody had to log in to start it. 
Um, turns out it's actually really hard to write a daemon correctly. Um, that precise technical definition means there's like a long checklist in um, advanced Unix programming interface. There's like seven things you have to do just in a very particular way. It doesn't sound that hard. It's actually surprisingly hard to get right. Um, one thing that happens a lot when you write these kinds of programs is that you have all these implicit dependencies. Um, that means that like it's easy to write a daemon. You're like, oh yeah, I just need to like print something to the like the log file, and I'm going to use like f puts to do that. Well, you got a dependency that's libc. That's not too surprising, but if you want to do I don't know some kind of image thing, you might have a dependency on libjpg all of a sudden, right? And like in this modern world of like pip and everything, that's not too surprising. But when you are trying to ship and deploy software, that can be very annoying because you have all these surprising things that you didn't know you actually needed. And that they just like cropped up a lot when you write traditional server software. Um, oh, what happened? Something changed. Um, also, this is like we talked about how this had a particular meaning in Unix. A uh, thing that kind of sucks about Unix is that it has what's called ambient authority. Um, so the Unix permissions model is not very granular traditionally. The real, like the level, the unit of permissioning is the user. So like you can have two different users, and you can say that they're not part of the same group, so they can't write to each other's files. They can't see each other's files. And this is useful, but this means that if you run, unless you factor your program up into, into separate programs that run under different users, this is called privilege separation. And it's a thing you can do, but it's now you have a distributed system that has to like have complicated IPC mechanisms. Unless you do that, you everything that's running in that process under a user can do anything that that user can do. So like it's really easy to write a server, it accidentally leaks like your TLS keys to people. Like, not that that ever happened to Cloudflare. Like that, that's a thing that like happens all the time, right? And so this is like a known problem with Unix where it's really easy. It's easy to do things you shouldn't do. Um, and as I said, demonization is easy to get wrong. Uh, a lot of people will start a daemon from an interactive shell. I said at the beginning, it's not supposed to be part of an interactive session. Well, how many of you started G-Unicorn from your like interactive shell? I, I know I have done that before. Um, the problem with that is like there are a bunch of things that make sense for your interactive shell that have now bled into that process. Environment variables are like the classic example. Your path could be pointed at something insane. Um, so like best practice is to have a separate program that starts it. It's it's very complicated. So Dockerized applications um, take a very different approach to this. So you have to explicitly pin down your dependencies. The reason for this is that what runs is called a container. There's a runtime artifact that exists only in memory, and that's called a container. And it's an instance of an immutable foundation, something that does not change once it's created. And that immutable foundation is called an image. So you can right now see that's like a powerful division of responsibilities, because if you can spin up an, a container from an immutable, immutable image, like you could scale up a web application, right? Everything you need is kind of implicit in that. So there's like. That seems like a really interesting and powerful concept. Additionally, because images are immutable, um, each instance is the same as every other. So there's like, and images are built from Docker files. So there's this sense of like, you have a recipe to get from like your Docker file to an image, and then from an image to many containers. So that whole implicit dependency thing, it kind of goes away because you have to explicitly put the stuff into the into the image, and once it's there, it's there for good. Um, so you have like. A lot of what you would expect out of, say, Chef or Puppet or other configuration management systems, you kind of get as part of the Docker experience. And that's known to be like configuration management systems are known to be a best practice in DevOps. So that's pretty cool. That's nice. And finally, um, you don't demonize ever. Um, they say, oh, I skipped something. Oh, right, I skipped one. Uh, Dockerized applications have to ask what they need, ask for what they need. And this is like the, the container does. So like there are things you cannot do in the container. Um, a classic example, I don't know how many of you people like to S-trace your processes when they do something you don't expect. Like every day, yeah. So you can't do that with Docker by default. If you can connect to the Docker container and get a shell, you can't S-trace it because the Docker container, everything in the Docker container has given up the capability to attach to processes with P-trace, which is the kernel facility on which S-trace is like built. So like this is an example of how there's like a very small surface of functionality that Docker provides your application, you have to ask for additional things. So that kind of combats the ambient authority problem, which is pretty nice. And finally, you don't demonize. So like that seven item checklist that's easy to mess up um, for when you write a daemon, you don't have to worry about that because your programs aren't doing a double fork to like drop the controlling terminal. They don't have to like CD into slash to make sure they don't hold on to mounts 
that you know would not be able to be unmounted all this horrible stuff goes away because you're not doing that you just start your program the way that you normally would start a program so that's nice um it's like not co totally like an uh, uh an original concept this might sound familiar if you've ever done static linking um this idea that you're going to pack everything together into an artifact that has everything you need to run it's very much related i think to static linking so back in the day this is how all programs were compiled so you'd have a program you'd have a thing called a linker that would copy in the dependencies we're talking about code right now but the idea is simpler like if you wanted when i said i wanted to use f puts in my like in my c program in my daemon the linker would go grab the definition of f puts and i copy it into the executable and the end result of this is that executable is ready to go. It doesn't have to go find any code anywhere. So that executable has all the dependencies that it needs. So a Docker file, you can kind of think of like your configure script and your make file, because it tells you how to build this image, right? And the image is like a process, is like the executable. And indeed, in like systems nomenclature, when you talk about the artifact on the disk that the like kernel will load into memory and run, that's called the process image, right? They generate a process image. So there's like a little bit of overlap of terminology even. And so the image ends up being kind of like a statically ex linked executable, and the container is like the running version of that, right? So there's like some overlap here, and it's a proven technology. That's cool, right? That's nice. And you might have heard there's this little program language that's kind of popular recently. It's called Go. It's only statically linked, and people laud Go for how easy it is to deploy, because you end up with a single executable, you plop that down on a computer, and you run. You don't ever see that giant traceback you see with pip when it complains about not finding like libxml's header files or something, right? So that's nice. But it turns out, unfortunately, uh, that we've talked about static linking in like the whole programming world for a long time. And I don't want to get too much into how like things work now, but that we left that behind years ago. We like C programs will use shared libraries. And basically what this means is your program, what would be an image in Docker, has a reference to code that it needs and where you might go look for that code. And at runtime, a special program that's part of your operating system goes and grabs it and puts it, like copies it at runtime into memory. That sounds kind of crazy, and some people don't like that. But the advantage is, if you change the code that's getting copied, all the programs that copy it instantaneously get a benefit from that. So like the classic example of the benefit of shared libraries is OpenSSL, because hey, we upgrade OpenSSL like once every two weeks, right? So with shared libraries, if you have a, a program that is dynamically linked, against the libssl shared library, you upgrade that once, all the programs that use it get a benefit from that. So there's this like ease of rolling forward with security releases. Um, you don't have to even know how to like recompile your programs. And like if you have closed source stuff, that might be really important because you can't recompile it. Now, this is of debatable value as Go demonstrates. Not everybody is convinced of the value of this. Um, PIP, as an example, has a vendor directory that carries its own copy of requests because there's I mean, PIP has to bootstrap stuff. But like you'll see evidence of this even in Python, where people will do an anal analogous thing to static linking. So like this isn't a, a written story, but it's worth bringing up the security benefits of shared libraries. There's no there's an analogous problem with Docker images. Let's say that you base your Docker file on some image foo, and then you need to upgrade libssl. Well, you have to go rebuild all of your images. Maybe that image is based on another image, and you have to trace back to the chain of images to find out where libssl is and make sure that it gets upgraded. Right? If you were just running a virtual machine, and you're running, say, Debian, there's an unattended upgrades program that you would just plug into cron, and in the background, it would update stuff. Following like security updates, you can give it a policy to apply stuff. There's no analogous thing to automatically build secure, like rebuild your Docker images to get security benefits. This is a big problem. This is a big problem. And as far as I know, there's no consensus on how to deal with this in, in the Docker world. One of the things that makes this hard is that it's really difficult to like pin down what these concepts are because you know, Docker is very ambitious. Um, that means that there's like a, like a lot of words that we have to use when we talk about Docker. And a lot of these words are, you know, they're, they're marketing terms. They're fancy terms, like, like cute little phrases that describe things that are actually really complicated and subtle concepts that you have to understand if you're going to use Docker effectively. Um, and a great example of this is the fact containers don't exist. This is not a contentious statement I, because I'm actually quoting Jessie Frizzell, who is truly an expert, and her blog's great. So if you just want to 
follow that link and read that for the rest of the presentation. I would not be offended. It's really good. Um, but they don't, containers don't have, like, you read about them in Docker's literature. People talk about containers. I talked about containers. They actually are a composite of two very unrelated technologies in the Linux kernel, control groups and namespaces. You can have control groups without namespaces and vice versa. Control groups organize processes and let you meter resource usage. So you could say, oh, this group of processes can only use these many CPU shares, which means they can't run amok with your CPU. Namespaces, which are a honking great idea that we should have more of, as you might know from Python, isolate things. So you can have a mount namespace. And that means that two different processes can have two different ideas of what slash means. Um, these are really, this may seem like splitting hairs, but it's important to bring this up um, because it leads to inconsistencies, weird inconsistencies. The reason for this in the article from the previous slide, um, Jesse Frizzell compares containers to things that actually are like reified concepts for their operating systems, Solaris zones and FreeBSD jails. I'll take jails as an example because I have more experience with FreeBSD. FreeBSD has a base system. That means that when they do a release of FreeBSD, they also do a release of LS, like the program LS that you type, or they do a release of find and cron. All that stuff comes together in one chunk. So when you say that you're going to spin up a jail with FreeBSD 10.3 release, you have a very precise idea of what that means. That's not true with containers. I mean, not just because we have, there's no such thing as containers. There's no such thing as a base system with Linux. Linux is, as you may have heard from Richard Stallman, just a kernel, right? And one way that we deal with this is we have distributions that provide software to run around that kernel, right? It provides user space stuff. And a lot of Docker images start with some distribution that's idea of what a base system is. So like Debian-based ones, like Debian and Ubuntu, will use Deb Bootstrap, which has an idea of necessary packages. That includes GNU core utils. So when you type ls in that container, or you run ls in that container, you get GNU's version. Other like Docker images that you want to pull from Docker Hub, they use Alpine, which uses BusyBox. So when you type ls, you get a very different implementation. So if you were trying to run a program that you expects a particular like set of command line arguments for ls, well, now you have to be very sensitive to which Docker image you're basing your, your, your image on. And if you go to Docker Hub, it doesn't immediately say, we use Alpine Linux, right? Like, for my contract work, bear with me, I had to install PHP and MySQL. I know. Um, it's fine. Um, and when I chose one of the library, one of the, the images on Docker Hub, it occurred to me that I assumed that it was Ubuntu, and it wasn't. It was actually like CentOS. And so that meant that like I was going to install some software. I had to install some other software that expected it be a particular version of Ubuntu, and it wasn't available for CentOS. And there was nothing on there's nothing on Docker Hub that says when you pull this PHP MySQL, it is going to be CentOS. So you have to manually trace through that lineage of images to find out what you're even getting. And this can be really bad because it turns out Alpine also doesn't use libc; it uses Musil now. I like Musil because static linking is cool to have a second like implementation of libc. Standard C library, that's where F puts would live. Musil is not exactly compatible with libc. Not only will some things not compile, worse yet, things will compile, but you will find out that you were using Musil because your program seg faults. So this is like the worst possible thing where like, hey, I didn't even need to install anything. I got this great image off of Docker Hub. I just ran with it. And I'm like, why, is I, why do I keep getting seg faults? Oh, right it's actually Alpine. So this is like, it makes it really difficult to rely on Docker Hub. And unfortunately, like, that's a big selling point for Docker Hub, the idea that like you can snap your fingers and have your PHP MySQL stuff ready to go, right? I mean, these things can be very difficult to set up. So it would be nice to be able to rely on that. And this is one very big reason in my experience that makes it difficult to rely on that. I think the genesis of that, the genesis of this inconsistency that's so problematic um, is a very reductionist perspective. Um, I think that Docker has like decided that simplicity is very powerful. And I think that that's true. Simplicity is obviously a very powerful like way to approach. Like if you try to figure out the simplest possible way to do it, you can ship faster and it allows like novel composition of different parts. Like there are good parts to simplicity. On the other hand, it can lead to really weird edge cases because you're focused so much on like the simple use cases. You don't see how these things combine. 
And furthermore, it often requires like a lot of work to do very simple tasks. Like I'm sure that like if you want to find, I'm trying to think of a good example, but if you've ever had to like write what seems like it's going to be a simple find invocation, like the find find one, like you're like, oh, I'm just going to go find all the files made in the last like day. And then I'm going to check what their like SHA-1 is, or sorry, SHA-256 is. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm going to check what their SHA-256 is. And if it looks like, if it's like not my approved list, I'm going to delete it. It's not fun to write that with find. Um, even though it composes well, like it's hard, it's, it takes a lot of like effort to put that together because they common use cases aren't encoded in the, in the, in the, in the command line, like interface, right? This is exactly how Unix is, right? Back in the day, this is what people complained about with Unix. Unix made it really easy, like you, everything is a file, right? Except everything that is not a file, right? <laughs> So like Unix has this simplifying assumption where every important thing is going to be a file and you can call read or write on it, right? The system calls read or write. That's not true because you can randomly seek in a file, but you can't randomly seek in a pipe. So that abstraction gets a little broken. Um, and if anybody's ever looked at Java's IO APIs, you can see how difficult it is to like fit that dimension in to, uh, the, to like the concept of a file. Sockets are even worse, right? Nobody ever uses like read or write on a socket, really. They use receive or they use receive message because you have very specific things you need to talk to the socket about. Like, hey, socket, I asked for 1,024 bytes. Just don't just block until you have that ready, right? You can't communicate that with the read API. You have to use receive message for that or receive. So this is a simplifying assumption that breaks down in practice. And it leads to like kind of crappy APIs. Like, I don't know that send message is actually that great in the API. Um, maybe if they had thought about this, if they had the foresight or whatever, we could reapproach that. You might end up with a better API 30 or 40 years later. And Docker knows, unlike the Sockets API, which I think started off rather unambitious, it was just going to make all the computers in the world talk to each other. But it was just a stream of bytes, right? Like that concept is relatively straightforward from an API perspective. Docker has like starts starts off by like wanting to promise you the world. So I gi I'm giving it a little bit of a harder time than than I would give like a historical API. Um, so an example of one of these simplifying assumptions, right, is that, oh, your application, it's just, it's going to run by itself. We're not going to stick any other crud in there. You know, you have all these things running on a Unix machine, like you have cron running in the background, you have like XM4, or God help you send mail. Like we don't need any of that. We don't need any of that. Your entry point, the thing that Docker is going to run, that's going to run as PID1. And that sounds really cool, except when you try to do anything that involves signals or processes. And to be fair, signals are the worst. But um, so with processes, like a little bit of Unix trivia, trivia for you that maybe you've bumped into, if you spawn a process, we call that the child. If its parent terminates, that process becomes a child of init. And when that process terminates, something has to retrieve its exit status to find out did it succeed, exit successfully? Was there a problem? So it's going to hang out. Its entry is going to hang out in the kernel's process table until somebody goes and says, hey, whatever happened to that process? And by convention, that's in it when the parent has terminated before the child. If nothing calls wait on it, it hangs around forever. And PIDs are a scarce like, resource. There are only like 32,000 PIDs on a default like configured Linux machine. So if your process is in it, you better be prepared to reap child processes that like, or like processes you didn't know anything about. And if your program isn't prepared to do that, and most programs are not, then you're going to, if you spawn any stuff that isn't really well behaved, if you spawn any parent process or any process that does not wait on its children, you're going to accrue zombies. This is a big enough problem. It's all we called zombies because they're waiting to die. Yes. Jokes. <laughs> Unix has all the jokes. Um, so this is enough of a problem that like Yelp wrote a big blog post about it. They have a thing called dumb in it. I know for a fact that certain large corporations also ran into this issue. Um, also there's a related to the way that signals are handled in it. One will like, it's, it's easy to make PID one ignore signals if you're not prepared to do it, which will lead to weird things. So skip through that. You can talk to me about signal handling. I love it so much. Um, also the default users root, we're right back to ambient authority, right? If you don't put a user directive, a user command in your Docker file, you're root. And now it's true that with the capabilities framework in Linux, it's given up a lot of what it can do, but root is root. You can still clobber files you didn't intend to. So it's great that they have like curbed ambient authority in some ways, but it's a shame that they didn't actually like make it required. Just tell me what user you need to run under. Um, 
So the worst, I, I mean, I think that like the worst part of that from an experiential perspective, like like actually dealing with Docker is that like you have this big pile of tools because of all the, like every time they build something, they're like, well, we're going to build the simplest thing. And then somebody says, well, we need to do this. And the answer is, well, we just need more Docker. We're going to build you a new tool to use to solve that problem that we, eh, we kind of like punted down the road. We'll solve it with more Docker. So like as an example, Docker files are really limited, right? You have a very small set of commands. And there's no way to specify a runtime dependency on another container, right? So that is to say that if my PHP container needs to talk to my SQL, there's no way to say that in Dockerfile. Maybe it's a good idea to have that not part of your Dockerfile, but it's the case that you can't express that. Well, good news is we have Docker Compose, right? Which will allow you to put dependencies that to, to articulate runtime dependencies. But the problem with Docker Compose is that it doesn't like scale out well, right? It has nothing to do with like if you have if you want to have like a bunch. Remember we talked about how great like images versus containers was because you could spin up a ton of containers for one image. There's nothing for that in Docker Compose, so you can't take that to production. You have to use Kubernetes, or Swarm, or DCOS, and all of these are completely different from each other. There's no easy path from Docker file to Compose. That's the easiest, but there's no easy path from Compose to like Kubernetes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. Use Minikube, come on. Um, so all the APIs are actually kind of crummy too, if you ask me. I know that there were some complaints about the fact that there's one layer. So with, when Docker, like if you're ever in Docker file and you see like like a line and then like some weird output with UUIDs and then a line and some, it's actually creating like a cache for every single line of the Docker file, which is kind of nutty because maybe you could just let me tell you what I want cache because I might know something about like the dependencies of my, code. So it'd be cool if you could do that. And why don't they syntax check it up front? Right? Like if I have a syntax file like issue at the very bottom of my Docker file and I'm loading tons of like I'm spinning up my MySQL database and I'm shoving 1.8 gigabytes of stuff into that MySQL database. And it takes a couple of minutes because my laptop's not that fast. And then I have a really dumb syntax error at the last line. I'm not going to find out about that until I waited a couple of minutes to to like for my MySQL to load. Why don't they just syntax check it? It would be nice if they did that. Um, but you know, reductionist perspective, let's keep it simple. Syntax checking, that's way too complicated. Just use ed, it's the standard editor. <laughs> and I mean, the, the worst, I mean, to summarize this, like I think that it's new technology, like the worst part, the ugliest part of this is it's new technology, which means new bugs, as I said, like um, I've had volumes refuse to unmount for some reason. Like it just the Docker container won't shut down. It's just I couldn't unmount the. I like somebody didn't unmount this. I'm like Docker, that's your problem. But they did not unmount it. And then I actually had a hard lock on my laptop. My laptop froze. I have a recent version of the kernel too. It's not like it's very old. I saw that unregistered net device. Like what is that? Is a PC load letter that is that's really not helpful. And if you Google this, people are like, yeah, it's fixed. And people are like, no, it is not fixed. There's no clear consensus on. What do you do with this? So it's and it's fair. It's a new technology. They're using these things that are relatively new. So it's to, to be expected that you'll have strange edge cases. But this is a problem if you want to productionalize it. And sometimes the Docker daemon just freezes, and you just got to restart it. Um, so what does this all mean? Am I telling you not to use Docker? No, no. I, I use Docker. Um, I've been recommending it to people because there's real value there, as we talked about with the implicit dependencies and stuff. Immutable infrastructure is great. Um, and if everybody, everybody's using Docker, like if I can communicate to somebody, you know, here's how you spin up a development environment, you just run a couple of commands, even if it works 90% of the time, a lot of the times a company or team or group of people working together have something that works 0% of the time. So 90% of the time is a big improvement. So it solves some problems, but it also introduces new problems. And so maybe when you are looking at Docker, you take a step back and you think about what your problems actually are. As an example, if you don't have a way to manage database changes like migrations or just checked in SQL somewhere, if you have no way to spin up a database from scratch, forget about Docker. Go work on that. That will give you way more in terms of like a productivity gain than, than anything that Docker is going to do. Docker doesn't have a solution for that. If you don't have tests, if you don't have automated tests or your tests are flaky, don't worry about Docker because how are you going to know if anything works when you do switch over to Docker? So a lot of times you might find the Docker is brought up in your company where people talk about Docker like it's a silver bullet. There's no such thing as a silver bullet. And there's no such thing as a free lunch. So keep that in mind when you switch to Docker. Evaluate it fairly. But there's no magic there. And that's it.
questions. Uh, questions. Uh-oh. I know there's got to be a few. I so if there's any technical, hand, l- l- let's see some hands. Yeah. If there's technical inaccuracies. I'm just going to say I'm trolling you. <laughs> That's like the classic defense for being wrong about something. Uh, I didn't spot any any technical inaccuracies, but uh, <laughs> I'm curious. You said you looked at Docker in like uh, 12 mm-hmm. and 13, 14, 15. What do you think was uh, deficient in Docker at those times that you looked at it that uh, you either solved now or went away or um, I'd say two big things pop out to me. Um, one was like going back to like 2012, 2013. So this is a while ago. Docker just called into LXC. Um, so LXC is a suite of tools, Linux containers, um, that's de- that was actually developed by Canonical. Um, and it's a it's it's also very Unixy in that you have like a little program that will create a container and a little program that'll run a something in a container and another little program that'll flip some switches for like user namespaces. And so. I, people were all excited about Docker in like 2012 and 2013, and hey, it's open source. So I went and read it, and like 90% of the code was like serving image, like a web server to serve images, like their the concept of of Docker images, and like the rest of it was just LXC. So, like I'm immediately suspicious of it because I had experience with LXC, and I know LXC can, is temperamental. So like, what happens when there's an LXC failure? Now I have to think about how Docker is interpreting that. So I immediately went. Like when I was doing container stuff in 2012, 2013, I just stuck with LXC because I know when it breaks what it's telling me versus like when LXC breaks, it tells Docker this and then Docker tells me like a second, secondary effects are hard to reason about. The other thing that happened was Docker grew a secret secrets management tool within like the last year or so that's actually fantastic. And Docker definitely wants, so secrets management means like, what, how do you get passwords into your applications? This is, of course, a huge pain when you try to operationalize something. And Docker has like a really good answer to this, that it has a nice API to it. It's implemented correctly. Um, I have high confidence that it's not going to leak your secrets. That's, that's worth a lot. That's worth a lot. And they've made improvements in other things like, there's like a prune command to Docker, uh, it, like to remove images that no longer have tags, which didn't exist for like four or five years. They got it like in December of 2016. So there are other incremental improvements, but those two things stuck out to me. The fact that they like actually implemented their own container runtime so that when there are errors, it wasn't just like me trying to figure out how they misused LXC. And then they developed a really compelling feature that like other people just don't have. Like there's no puppet. Well, there is a puppet answer to secrets, but it's not as good. <laughs> Do you want Great to... answer. More questions, Kurt. So, sorry, it's not exactly a question. I just wanted to like <laughs> stand up, you know, Docker Holics Anonymous, and share my favorite problem with Docker files. <laughs> they have this yes. like command thing, where, which is which is like execute something as if it were a bash shell, right? Mm-hmm. And somewhere along the line, somebody said, you know what? Uh, just putting a raw string in there is bad because you get into like shell splitting of stuff. And they said, you know, it'd be better. Let's give like a JSON list. But then they didn't add like a separate command that takes a JSON list and one that takes a string. What they did is they try to always parse it as JSON. And if that parse fails, it must have been a string. <laughs> so is that why they can't do like static syntax <laughs> so checking? You, you, you like leave a comma out or you don't close this, then it just like passes that whole JSON blob, you know, to bash or whatever. <laughs> so like will it actually will batch in, in, interpret like the open bracket as like the test command? I, I, Could I write an like a command that is parsable both as JSON and a test command? <laughs> Can I write a quine with this? Yeah, I'm gonna go home. Let's... That sounds like the thing to make Docker file reliable. You should definitely <laughs> get on that. <laughs> Docker Holics Anonymous is a pretty good idea. My, I mean, my favorite the thing about Docker is how like every time you have a problem, you Google for it and you don't get Stack Overflow, you don't get anything. You just get GitHub issues of Moby, <laughs> right? And there's an issue that was opened in 2014. And then you follow it to the bottom. It's like closed in favor of this other issue right. open in 2016. Like, you know, and then it closed in favor of this issue that was open later in 2016. And that one's got like 80 different comments and it's still open now. It was just like somebody commented on it like 40 minutes ago. Like, what do you mean you still haven't fixed this? <laughs> <laughs> it's really, uh, it, and it happens every single time. So uh, I'm glad we're having this. And uh, and the docs, the Somebody's docs themselves it. will link to like probably if you do like a, a, a thing like the the top link is to either GitHub issues or Go docs because uh, basically you Docker just, just defines like right yeah. it's like look well, our behavior for this is just whatever Go does right and so like you know it could could change. be simpler yeah it's obvious so so like we parse a URL like how Go does and we parse a JSON how Go does and we don't know how that is we'll just link to that um, so. <laughs> You know, I mean, they Bless at least they link. <laughs> at least they didn't pretend like they invented it. Uh, but yeah, Docker Holics Anonymous should become like a recurring thing. Any other like this. really good stories? 
or questions? Questions. Yeah. Moshe? All right. So add is a command to either uh, put a file in your Docker oh, or expand uh, uh, a tarball or a zip file. It will do it automatically if it's tarball or zip file. It'll also or fetch a URL. That's it. Yes, it yeah. will fetch a URL for you if you uh, add a URL. What trust um, route does it use for SSL? That's a question. <laughs> No, not a, that, that was a joke. That, don't answer that. <laughs> no, Go Go actually has a decent TLS. Yeah, they, that's actually. what they copied for cryptography 2.0, I think. Cooper, did you Who's think laughing you could now? beat that one? Uh, what that one? So Facebook doesn't use Docker? No, OK. I, I'm surprised that they can scale without Docker. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Roy? So, so kind of with that, one thing that I noticed with uh, Docker is that there is like, quite the hype train around it right like someone sees a hacker news article they go to a meetup they like see docker and they come and tell everyone in the organization it's going to fix all the problems and spend I mean, some un unknown amount of time trying to do 140 stuff. million dollars of vc money like or or they you know have a multi-billion dollar no valuation hype that's with, all real with no business model <laughs> um i'm interested as someone who's like actually used docker yeah sorry <laughs> first let's like check to a show docker um but as someone who's actually using it in, in production, I'm interested to kind of hear your take on like, how do you handle tempering expectations? How do you think about like? Uh... I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I haven't done it successfully. Um, I, the, the times that I've um, evaluated it, like 2012, 2013, 2014, I said no each time, and nobody listened to me. <laughs> um, and as far as I know, none of those deployments were very successful. And so I think that. I don't have a great answer for that. I think like any technology, one way that you do it is you develop enough, you have somehow expertise on hand that can put together something that shows how it works and how it doesn't work. And I think that this is a larger problem when building like real systems that we don't confront, which is when you demo something or when you talk about something, you have to also show its failure modes. Nobody does this, right? It's very counterintuitive, certainly, if you're going to have a demo where it's like, look at how fast it is. And by the way, I'm going to make it fail for you right now. Like, that doesn't sound exciting. But if that's a process that you can build into your engineering culture, it's easy to combat hype. And it's also easy to have, like, postmortems. It's a lot of, like, good practices come out of that. So I've focused on that to try to be like, we need to think about what the failure modes are. Um, and I think that's maybe even more successful. Ask me in two years. <laughs> <clears throat> Thoughts, comments, thoughts, comments on this important technology of our time? So sad. <laughs> Are they even still in business? <laughs> I mean, CoreOS is kept al alive somehow. Alex is keeping it going. Mo Moshe gives it a... Moshe, Moshe is, is not a buy on CoreOS uh, options right it's now. It's a system D, right? Oh, oh, I see. Uh, yes, Moshe did uh, have some uh, <laughs> recruiting style interaction with CoreOS, and he reports that they do not offer such a... I mean, they offer, depending on how you want to look at it, a very competitive salary. <laughs> 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 They're really competing uh, with themselves. Okay. Um, yeah. Calling it? Okay, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's great. It. Okay. No, I, I actually let him go over time because he was doing such a great job. Give it Aww. up for Mark, everyone. Well, I, I think that everyone would agree that was a great Peninsula for July. Uh, you know, that, I mean, may have even been better than the last time we did without Guido. So, uh, yeah, basically, if, um, if there are any last-minute announcements, uh, Moshe, you know, you usually close up these sorts of things. I will reiterate that video game night is still happening. There is still pizza. There's a microwave. Uh, and there are caffeinated drinks along with two Wiis and two Xboxes. And I can sort of play Mario Kart. So you can come beat me at Mario Kart if you want. But yes, yeah. Moshe, um, please. OK, yes. Yeah, so um, to kind of Mahmoud's uh, last point, uh, we have you know, this space-ish until 9.30, so feel free to hang around. Also, feel free to join uh, the video game night uh, at uh, and the rest of the Shopkick engineers uh, some play. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we are looking specifically for uh, August hosting. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, if you can make it happen for us, we will be very grateful. Uh, I will probably, unfortunately, have to skip August for personal reasons, but uh, I'm sure my colleagues will do a great job on that. This is how you tell me, Moshe? Didn't they tell you that? No, Sorry, I know. It's okay. 
Um, anyway, um, and uh, and to reiterate, we are always looking for more speakers. Uh, please come talk to us. We do not want to have the same speakers over and over again. We are sure each of you has something they do that is interesting, and we are happy to let you have the stage and talk about this. Uh, we can all learn from each other. Um, and I guess with those words, uh, uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, that's it for Peninsula. Oh, Moshe had this caricature of us done. Uh, <laughs> uh, my latest blog post shows how I edit uh, 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 these pictures with uh, Jupiter. Uh, if you want to know how to use Jupiter for image editing. Yeah, Ju Jupiter for image editing. It actually was surprisingly good. Orbifold. OK, Orbifold. So if you want to see Moshe's blog, you simply visit Orbifold, spelled like, spelled like, it, uh, like it sounds, like Orbifold uh, dot XYZ, which is the hot TLD. Uh, and so, yeah, image editing with and Jupiter, scroll down, scroll down. Uh, which he published during Peninsula, um, and he edited me out of the caricature, which is no. very, very uncouth. But no, yeah, it's great. You put, use a notebook to like do image editing, crop it. Anyways, well, yeah, thanks everybody. Uh, come socialize, or be antisocial and go play video games. <laughs>